So hold on. Uh, let's see. I just want to remind you all to keep your mics muted. Um, it's really helpful if you're mindful of that for us. Um, I want to let you know that there will be a Q&A after the presentations and we'll be taking the questions out of the chat box. So if you have a question during the presentation, please chat, type it into the chat box and Corliss Davis will read them to David after the program. I want to let you know that the program is being recorded and will be up uploaded to the library's website and YouTube page um, as soon as I can get to it. Um, tonight's speaker, David Yarbrough, earned his PhD at the University of Massachusetts. He retired from the University of Maine in 2017 after working there for 40 years, after which he, he was interim executive director for the Wild Blueberry Commission of Maine and Wild Blueberry Association of North America in 2019. So thank you so much for joining us tonight, um, David, and we look forward to your presentation. Thank you. It's always nice to uh, talk a little bit about wild blueberries. Uh, a few people commented on this uh, poster, and, and this was actually a summer class poster for the University of Maine. Uh, that was done uh, by our public affairs people. And you can see the iconic main bear in uh, the wooden, the old wooden box of blueberries. Um, this is kind of a history uh, with an uh, overview of what the industry is. And uh, usually when I do this, I like to start at the beginning. And for wild blueberries, the beginning was quite a while ago, uh, about 25,000 years ago, Right where you're sitting now, we had at least two miles of ice on top of us. And uh, that great glacier started to recede. And about uh, 15,000, between 15,000 and 10,000 years ago, it receded such that uh, plants could colonize the landscape. And uh, this, these plants that colonized the landscape, uh, one of the first ones uh, were the wild blueberry. And when I give uh, this lecture to kids in the classes, I, I ask about uh, how did the blueberries get here? You know, I ask them, did they walk? Did they fly? Did they swim? And actually, uh, two out of the three is right. They flew because birds eating the berries from the south came up and flew over and deposited the seeds. But the best spreader actually were bears uh, because bears eating the blueberries coming into the fields, uh, they had a much better fertilizer package uh, to, uh, to go along with it that helped the plants out to be established. So these plants are, were in the understory of the landscape, but essentially, you know, there wasn't any nutrients in the soils at all, and there wasn't any way for plants to obtain nutrients. So how did they, how did they get in and how did they survive? So uh, the answer is actually infection. And you say, well, infection, that doesn't sound too good. Uh, but this infection uh, was a mycorrhizal infection. And what it was is this fungi uh, entered the roots, penetrated the roots of a wild blueberry plant. And these fungi could actually take minerals out of the soils that were unavailable. They broke down the soil and they're able to take the nutrients out of the soil into the blueberry roots. And in turn, the blueberries gave the fungi food, you know, carbohydrates. So it was this, this uh, relationship, this symbiotic relationship that allowed blueberries to go where no plants had ever gone before. So this is the way they established. And uh, this is why they were one, among the earliest uh, plants that came in uh, onto the landscape. We do have a couple different types of blueberries. So uh, they're both uh, low bush types. There's a sweet low blueberry, it's about a foot and a half or so. Uh, and then there's a sour top or velvet leaf blueberry, uh, which is uh, a little bit taller a little bit less productive, more branched, fuzzier stems. And actually they're genetically incompatible. Uh, about 95% of, of the sweet low bush blueberries are, are sweet low and the other top, uh, the other 5% or so are the sour top. Also what's different about our wild blueberries is they're concentrated uh, mostly along the coast in Maine, but also in Atlantic Canada and in uh, Quebec around the a large Lake, Lac St. John region. So we, we find our blueberries not throughout the world, but really uh, in Maine, Atlantic Canada and Quebec are the only place in the world that our wild blueberries do grow. Cultivated okay. blueberries are, are also a um, North American, they're native to North America, uh, but they're different and they grow on higher bushes. 
and they are able to be propagated by hardwood cuttings. And so they can be easily propagated and they can be spread throughout the world in three to five uh, years, you have a large uh, productive plant. And so this ability to, to be able to uh, propagate has, has allowed these plants to spread throughout the world, even though, again, like the lowbush blueberry or wild blueberry, they're native to North America. The other difference is, is the height of the bushes. These bushes are get up to be over six feet tall uh, and they're hand-picked, uh, usually two, three times, perhaps uh, for the fresh market. And this is what you generally see in the stores. Uh, the last picking is this over the, over the row mechanical harvester that shakes the berries off. And these go into the frozen, uh, frozen food market. But most of the berries are, uh, are for the fresh market for, for cultivated blueberries, different than the wild. The other big difference, and I say big uh, because the size of the berries, uh, the cultivated blueberry has been selected from the wild for a large size. And they also have been bred to increase the size of the fruit. So here's uh, in the middle is our cultivated blueberry. Here is the native wild Maine blueberry. And here is the European uh, blueberry or bilberry uh, that's even smaller and darker than our fruit. Another difference is the genetic diversity. Uh, this is a kind of a, a graph of the productivity of the wild blueberry versus the cultivated. And the cultivated blueberries have been uh, selected for a small part of their populations. And they've selected mostly for a higher, much higher productivity, larger fruit size. And so uh, within any uh, cultivated blueberry field, there may be half dozen different varieties. Within any wild blueberry field, there may be hundreds to thousands of different varieties that we call clones. And so we get a much different mix of fruits and flavors. Uh, it's really this uh, mixture of all these different types of varieties that are as different as Macintosh and delicious apples that give uh, our wild blueberries their uh, distinct uh, nature and our large difference over the fewer varieties of cultivated blueberries that you find. If you look on Google Earth, uh, wild blueberry fields are pretty easy to find. Uh, this is around Montgale Lake uh, uh, and down eastern Columbia, Maine. Uh, you can see the fields scattered throughout the woods. They generally between uh, Route 9 and Route 2 uh, and Hancock and Washington County is where you, you find most of the blueberries. Uh, but you also find blueberries along uh, Knox Lincoln County, certainly, and even over into the western Maine in Oxford County. So they are scattered throughout the state, state with a concentration in, uh, in down East Maine. Maine has about uh, 38,000 acres of blueberries and uh, two of the largest uh, process of, uh, two of the largest food, fruit, uh, fruit processing uh, um, companies in the state or, or landowners. Another different aspect about wild blueberries is their fields are pruned every other year. So we have a two year cropping cycle. They prune the plants. There's a vegetative growth here with no fruit and then there's crop year field. And this is very unique in that it is able, enables us to uh, reduce some of the, some of the uh, insect and disease problems uh, by breaking up their, their cycles. Uh, but the downside is, a, is that it requires about twice as many acres uh, to grow wild blueberries and it does uh, cultivated blueberry. Blueberries have been pruned uh, principally by fire. The Native Americans uh, had burned over the fields uh, for thousands of years. Back in the 1940s, uh, they implemented this uh, oil burner, which is a big oil tank. Uh, and this is a, essentially a, a blower. So it's a huge flamethrower. And this is able to, to uh, prune plants or incinerate the plants right to the ground surface and it does a pretty good job of sanitation uh, killing any insects or, or diseases in the soil as well. So it did have some upsides uh, when oil was two or three cents a gallon uh, and, and global warming wasn't an issue. Uh, it was, it was a, a good idea but at this point now what we know with the price of oil plus uh, global warming uh, this practice is pretty much been uh, discontinued uh, for those reasons, as well as liability. Uh, if you do burn up the field and a fire gets away from you, uh, you get fined. Uh, they, they charge you for, for uh, putting the fire out and anything you burn, you bought. So 
This is uh, not a practice that's really commonly done anymore. But the reason for doing it was all those rocks in the fields. And really, we couldn't get around uh, mowing the fields uh, with those rocks. So what they did is they brought in excavators. And these excavators were able to pull the rocks out. And they were actually able to uh, take, the, take uh, the, the hummocks out of the fields and level the fields. And this allowed uh, well, blueberry growers to reduce two of the, the biggest cost, uh, one cost is the pruning costs, so getting away from fire. The other cost is harvesting cost, uh, harvesting by hand and going to mechanical harvesters uh, greatly reduced uh, the cost of, of production for our fields. There are plenty of rocks down east and if you want some, I think I can find you a good source. So uh, they're out there. They just kind of put them off to the side and they're waiting for you. This is uh, the type of mower that they use now to, to prune wild blueberry fields. It's a flail type mower and this gang system allows it to follow the contour of the field and prune plants right to the ground, right to the, within an inch of the ground, which duplicates that effect of burning without the uh, economic environmental uh, penalties of doing it. We can do this because about two thirds of the biomass of the wild blueberry plant is actually underneath the ground. Uh, and those stems sticking up only constitute about a third of the biomass. So essentially we're pruning off uh, the, the, the old stems, uh, regenerating new stems that are much uh, more juvenile and productive. And this two year cropping cycle has been found to maximize uh, productivity in blueberry fields and as practiced everywhere where there are wild blueberries. So here's the vegetative field. And I'd like to point out on this field, you can see these different colored greens. There's a dark green and a lighter green, and this green is different than that. These are actually what we call clones or individual varieties of wild blueberry plants. And these clones, uh, there's approximately uh, 4 million of them out in, in, in the fields uh, throughout Maine. And so uh, some, of the, some of the size of them uh, are larger than a football field and have been here for hundreds of years. Uh, so that's another unique aspect of it. But it, as I mentioned, it's, it's what really makes wild blueberries wild and unique uh, is, is they're not planted. And they also have this great diversity of different flavors and colors for, of the fruit. Uh, that gives you uh, a mix that really can't be duplicated uh, by a cultivated field or by planting, even planting uh, the, the cultivated low bush blueberries. Also, it provides uh, a really nice uh, uh, foliage in the fall when your leaf keepers are out uh, going down through the blueberry barrens is a real treat uh, because some of these clones are really vibrant red in the, in the fall. And we do have open fields. Uh, they provide open fields for habitat. Maine is 90% forested. So having this open habit, habitat gives some, uh, gives some wildlife a chance to, uh, to find uh, homes. One of them is the turkeys and, and the turkeys have established them uh, well in blueberry fields throughout. I know you see them down uh, running around the roads and, and, and uh, Waldo County and they're uh, they were reintroduced and they've made it their home in blueberry fields because it, they, they do eat some fruit, but they also eat insects and weed seeds. So they kind of pay for, pay for the fruit by uh, providing some pest management as well. Uh, so most growers don't mind too much uh, having them in the field. Over the winter, uh, the leaves drop off and the stems, are, if they're covered by snow, this provides an extra layer of insulation and protects the plants. Uh, so when they come out in the spring, uh, they're not injured. Generally in, in um, uh, April or May, uh, you're starting to see the buds swell and the, and the flowers coming out uh, at, at that point in time. We also see a lot of other types of insects come out at that point in time earlier in the season. And these all like blueberries as well. Some of them like the fruit, the buds, the leaves, and these particular insects can be devastating the crops. And, and so they, they do have to be monitored. Uh, and one particular one is the blueberry maggot and a new pest called the spotted wing drosophila that I'll, I'll mention a little bit. We have a way to, to monitor for these. We use the old butterfly net or the sweep net to, to gather gather uh, any insects on the, on the plants and we have a threshold level 
And right here in the background shows what can happen. These insects will chew the uh, plants right to the ground and we get zero productivity in, in these areas. So what we want to do is monitor these and if there is a problem, uh, then we can treat the fields uh, and not do it needlessly. We do have a disease in our blueberry field called mummyberry, and this is the little mummified berry right here. It produces spores and it blights the, the plant, uh, much like potato blight, it kills the tops of the plants. And you can see in the fields here that not all the plants are affected uh, because they open at different stages. And this is another advantage of genetic diversity. We don't have a monoculture in a wild blue fields, although we have one type of plant, we have many different varieties. And so this confers some, some natural uh, ability for protection as well. There's some work done in Agriculture Canada. We, we have a good working relationship with our Canadian colleagues and, and they found that the difference in the, the, the amount of wetness and the temperature uh, really determined whether the plants would be infected. So if you don't have those conditions, there's no reason to, to, uh, to be able to spray your blueberries. Uh, because the, the plants are infected and you can't really see uh, the damage until 10, nine or 10 days later, we really have to treat the plants to prevent the infection. And we, have, we do this by uh, having weather stations uh, throughout the blueberry fields uh, that monitor the temperature and moisture conditions. Uh, this information is put up on the web. It's also, there's also a telephone you can call into and we have a listserv that we send out information to growers and it tells them in their area whether they uh, have reached that that period of high uh, infection that would require them to be able to protect the plants uh, to prevent the plants from being uh, infected and reducing the, the crop. There's another pest that, that's evolved uh, with, the, with the blueberry, the wild blueberry, and that is the uh, wild blueberry maggot. It's a, it's a small fruit fly that lays an egg in the fruit, much like uh, the apple maggot. And the problem was when the blueberries were being canned back in the 40s and 50s, uh, the cans would have the maggots in them and they'd float to the top. So you get this nice layer of uh, thick cream on the top of the, of the can, which was actually maggots, which didn't go over too well with uh, the housewives buying it or anybody wanting to eat them. So they brought in a, uh, a entomologist from uh, Washington, D.C that worked out the, the cycle of, of the wild blueberry and determined how we could control it. And basically back then controlling it was using uh, a dust, uh, it calcium arsenate. Uh, these were fairly toxic materials and very long lived. Uh, so unfortunately they could control it, but uh, with materials that uh, nowadays we would never be able to use. We now monitor for the, for the uh, fruit fly. This is an apple maggot trap, it's baited. So this, is, this smells like a really big blueberry. It gets the flies to come to it, uh, they stick to it. And we can tell a couple of things. We can tell number one, if the flies are in the field, number two, when they emerge. And so we can prevent them from laying eggs in the field. So this is very important to, to be able to do that to target uh, any applications or not have any applications at all if we don't have any flies. We also had an entomologist, Frank Drummond, that did some work uh, looking at the movement of flies uh, into the field. And these flies uh, would be coming in from the fields that had fruit in them last year. Uh, they're pruned, so the next year when those flies come up out of the soil where they hibernate over the winter, there's no fruit. So they fly over the wall or, or across the road into the fields or from the woods and into the neighboring fields. So we put traps out along the edge. We found that they're not very good flyers and they really don't make it uh, more than 50 feet into the field. So what we can do is just spray the perimeter of the field. And this way, when the flies come out, we can, we can reduce any kind of treatments we, uh, we do by 80% or more. So under, understanding the biology um, is, is very important to to being able to uh, control the species. A new fly that came in about 10 years ago is called the spotted wing drosophila. And this particular fly is like the fruit fly you get on your bananas, but it lives outside and it will infect any soft fruit. 
And the first year we had it, we lost. So the last week of harvest was gone. Uh, the fruit was completely taken out uh, by this fruit fly. But we've seen the captures a little bit later and in fewer years than in the, in the past. And we use a different type of trap here. This is a, this is a vinegar or a, or a yeast solution uh, that attracts them in there. So we can actually uh, count when they come and uh, if, how many are there. And they also, our entomologist Frank has worked out uh, thresholds again, so that we only treat uh, if we find them and if we find enough of them in the field. Also, this enables uh, uh, smaller growers to, to use squat treatments. Uh, so if there's just one, edge of the field that they need to treat, they can do that as well. The next stage uh, in, in the spring is the flowering stage. And this generally occurs uh, we're down east from um, uh, May 20 to May 30. And these blueberry flowers are not wind pollinated and they're not pollinated by black flies as some people think. They do need to be insect pollinated though. And in many blueberry, in all of our blueberry fields, we have uh, literally hundreds of different types of bees, bumblebees, uh, soil dwe dwelling bees uh, that give us that initial um, pollination. But we do need to supplement that to get higher yields to compete with a cultivated blueberry. So they brought in, uh, they brought in uh, uh, honeybees. Now, honeybees are Mediterranean species. So if it's uh, windy, if it's cold, if it's wet, if, uh, you know, they really don't want to work. So they do a great job of working when the sun comes out and it warms up. But, you know, spring in Maine is not always like that. So we also bring in now a uh, 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 type of honeybee that's uh, um, produced in Detroit, Michigan. Uh, and these bees are put in boxes. Uh, they originally used for greenhouses. They put in boxes and shipped to Maine. And we can also supplement our wild blueberry fields with these bees because these bees will work when it's cold, when it's wet, and when it's dark. They'll, uh, they're really adapted to our conditions. And they also have a, a, a buzz sonication where they get on the flower and they, and they throw them their wings and it causes a, a lot of that pollen to come down. So they're much more efficient uh, than a honeybee uh, as well. The other endrenids are, 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 are the bees that are in the fields uh, naturally are native bees. And you can see these might look like uh, anthills, but these are actually indrenid holes. And they, you can have a, a little colony of bees in there and they, they, an entire life, the only thing they do for their entire life is just uh, pollinate blueberries. And that's their cycle. And they go back in and they hibernate into the next year and come out and do it again. Here's a, here's a graph uh, looking at showing the number of honeybee hives per acre uh, and how that increases the blueberry productivity. But you notice right here with zero hives, we get maybe 1,200 pounds or so of yield from those native bees. But in order to increase the productivity, we can see we get a nice, uh, a strong linear relationship of increasing the blueberry productivity with increasing the yields. We also can see that same effect when we're looking at the, um, the um, wild blueberry um, hives brought in the state. This blue line is the yield in millions of pounds and the red line is thousands of hives. And you can see a very good relationship uh, between increasing the amount of bees, increasing the amount of blueberries. And you also see a lot of scatter and they don't all fall on the line. That's because bees are not the only factor of increasing productivity or uh, uh, productivity for blueberries, but they are a major factor in increasing the number of hives, increases the number of bees. Why this happens is that you get more berries uh, pollinated. You get larger berries because the more visits per berry, uh, the more seeds, the larger the fruit. And you also get more even ripening. So all these factors factor in together and greatly enhance the yield of wild blueberries uh, using uh, both honeybees and native bees and the bumblebees. Water is becoming an issue uh, with the, the warmer temperatures, uh, uh, drier, drier seasons in Maine with global warming. And we do have some of the larger growers investing in these, uh, these irrigation guns. This is a big <coughs> gun irrigation. It can do about an acre with uh, one of these guns. And these fields are 
are have in ground systems and this is really uh, a, a, an insurance policy uh, for those years that we do have a really dry year. In fact, last year was actually one of those years uh, we had uh, just about half a blueberry crop uh, from a freeze and a, a combination of a freeze and a dry. Well, wild blueberries ripen really uh, from the last week of uh, July and through Labor Day, uh, depending on, uh, on the season and, and, and where you are in the state. Uh, certainly they go from the south to, or, or from the south to the north or, or um, uh, from the west to the east, down east. And there's only uh, one chance to harvest. Uh, they, they pick the point where most of the blueberries are ripe. And these blueberries are then uh, then harvested once over, unlike the cultivated blueberries, which are picked uh, picked several times. Uh, and it's been uh, it's been a tr real tradition in Maine. Uh, a lot of school kids uh, got their got their money, and and they used to go out uh, raking blueberries. It was even a, a, um, a subject of photographs uh, at the Pullman Museum of Art uh, a few years back as well. And this shows uh, what the the older the old winnow machines are, or uh, basically it's a blower uh, that would blow the leaves and the stems out of the blueberries, and they were put into these uh, half bushel wooden boxes, uh, picked into these uh, uh, wooden uh, wooden type baskets. Uh, but that's uh, that's something of the past, and and isn't done anymore. Uh, in the past too. In the United States in the 1950s, Maine was the number one producer of blueberries, any kind of blueberry in the world. Uh, but that's changed over time. Uh, cultivated blueberries have certainly uh, come up and uh, a lot of the blueberries even uh, moved out of the Northeast uh, into the Western, uh, Western states. And if we look at the uh, blueberry pie, uh, cultivated blueberries now uh, are almost three quarters of the crop uh, Canadian wild are about a uh, quarter and Maine is down to uh, about only 7%, less than 10% uh, because of uh, increases in, in blueberry production elsewhere. Uh, all, all of the crops are grown, but the proportion of blueberries elsewhere has grown uh, a lot more than, than it has in Maine. Historically, they weren't picked, but they were raked. And this is, a, this is an old Tobit rake that was built in the 1800s, uh, fashioned after a cranberry scoop. And you can see that it's been modified with two, uh, two, uh, two handles, much larger uh, going to 100, 120 teeth. And this is about 40, 40 45 teeth. Uh, so they can, they can rake a lot more blueberries a lot easier. And instead of uh, school children, uh, Mexican laborers uh, come up and have been filling that gap uh, for the hand labor for a crop uh, more recently. They used to put the uh, blueberries in, in uh, five gallon buckets and, and, you know, from the winnow machines. And they found this greatly decreased the quality. The more you handle the blueberry, the, the worse the quality. So they got away from this and they just raked directly into the boxes. And they found this uh, only handling once and also having the stems and leaves in there to cushion the berries gave you uh, a much better uh, blueberry uh, product uh, on its on its way to the being processed. So this is the way uh, that it's done now. But mostly it isn't done by hand now. It, it's done by machines. And this is the back of a, a wild blueberry harvester. These are rotating heads, uh, picking heads that, that scoop the berries up. They come up off onto a conveyor and back into uh, back into these boxes on the back of the tractor. These picking heads actually were uh, developed at the University of Maine. Uh, by uh, a student in the 1970s, Gleason Gray, who came to be a, an extension agent for uh, probably 40 years as well. And uh, it was picked up by a Canadian company, uh, Bragg Lumber Company, and they're now produced out of Collingwood, uh, Nova Scotia. Also see another addition is these lights on the top of the tractor, which, which we hadn't uh, seen until fairly recently. And that's because now <clears throat> with the fields being leveled, uh, they can take these tractors and they can pick uh, day and night. And this allows some of these, uh, these machines to come down from uh, Canada uh, to pick Maine wild blueberries for two weeks and then go back to Canada and pick their, their crop, which is uh, coming in a little bit later. So this is the way uh, probably 95% of, of wild blueberries are picked now uh, by these machine type harvesters. We do have a small harvester for, for small growers, uh, and this is uh, designed after a cranberry picker as well. 
And this particular machine uh, is produced in Columbia Falls, Maine, and uh, so is used by uh, many, many small growers. There are also alternatives. This is a kind of a rake on wheels, and this is something that, that's built up in Quebec. So there are alternatives for very small growers that uh, also wish to mechanically harvest their, harvest their fields. When the blueberries are picked, they're generally put into uh, refrigerated containers if they have to go any kind of distance to, to cool that fruit down and to maintain the quality. Uh, they're brought into the processing plants and generally they're processed uh, within 24 hours uh, to uh, maintain the quality of the fruit. So uh, actually they're, they're much fresher than some of the cultivated blueberries uh, that are, are picked uh, especially those coming from overseas, they might be picked for a couple of weeks earlier, uh, shipped in uh, under controlled atmosphere and brought into the uh, stores as fresh blueberries. And they would be much older than those wild blueberries that you'd find in your freezer container that are picked at the peak of ripeness and frozen uh, fairly shortly after that. This is a blower. And this particular machine takes the place of, uh, of that winnow machine we saw on the field. Uh, it blows <clears throat> all of the leaves and the sticks out of the fruit. Uh, then this fruit is put in through a, a washing bath to clean it off. It goes through riffles to get any dirt or debris or deer pellets that might be out in the field. Everything gets washed out and, and cleaned up uh, along in these processing lines. <clears throat> And then it's put into uh, an instant quick freeze uh, tunnel that individually <coughs> freezes, excuse me, individually freezes these berries. <clears throat> these berries then can be uh, handled very easily and, uh, and pretty much uh, stored. The, they're pretty bulletproof at that point in time. They can be stored for a couple of years if need be and can be easily poured and, and uh, uh, put into different types of containers uh, <clears throat> for commercial or uh, uh, home markets. They also use uh, some uh, technology. Uh, <clears throat> this is a laser sorter. And basically, a laser beam goes across this, this belt. And it blows, <clears throat> it blows uh, a, a stream of air out. So any of the berries that aren't blueberries or aren't blue enough get ejected here. And uh, this is a very rapid uh, uh, screening process that allows them to, uh, to essentially, they have to uh, freeze the either 100 million pound crop in about 30 days. Uh, so they have uh, more than a million pounds going through some of these processing plants uh, uh, every day. Uh, and they're stored into, uh, into containers uh, uh, with a poly bag uh, and a thousand pound containers. And these can, again, uh, because they're individually frozen, they can be poured out and uh, reallocated into smaller containers as well. <clears throat> well, there's been a really uh, big increase in blueberry consumption uh, over time. And, and basically, this has been driven by the health, method, health uh, message. And uh, when I give uh, talks to uh, kids in schools, I, they all know, seem to know what an antioxidant uh, is, so it must be working. And wild blueberries generally have uh, twice as many antioxidants as cultivated blueberries and many of the other crops. There are other fruit that do have higher antioxidant levels, but they're not as available or as affordable as wild blueberries are. Um, and and what, what antioxidants are here, what, so, excuse me, what they are is uh, the Blue pigment in the fruit uh, has a pigment called the anthocyanin. And this particular anthocyanin has antioxidant properties and that there are these, so these are free radicals here. It gives you an idea what they look like here and how the process works. But these free radicals are, are uh, oxygen uh, molecules that have an extra electron and they can be very devastating to DNA. Uh, they can cause damage to cells which are attributed to aging and cancer. And so wild blueberries uh, tend to mitigate this process and, and help that uh, from happening. Also, uh, there are some animal studies that have shown that with 
with rats, the, the older rats can be uh, can do as good cognitively and physically as young rats on a blueberry diet. So many of the health benefits <coughs> with, a, with the antioxidant properties, improved memory and motor skills, uh, cancer fighting promise, reduced eye strain, <coughs> and they're effective as cranberries to uh, treat urinary tract infections as well. So we have improvements and cardiovascular health, brain health, insulin response, and cancer reduction. So all these good things blueberries do <clears throat> attract people to increase their consumption of blueberries. <clears throat> but wild blueberries essentially are an ingredient, and those ingredients traditionally have gone into pies and muffins and um, pancakes and on cereal and that type of thing. Uh, but things have changed really. Uh, the muffin category has really diminished. And what we're seeing now is that blueberry smoothie is really the number one product that people use their blueberries in. And there's uh, tons of recipes on, on the, uh, the wildblueberries.com website of great, uh, great smoothie recipes. The other, again, are st still ingredients in yogurts, jams, and, and, and other products. Black blueberry jams are made both in Maine and all the way to uh, Japan. Uh, Japan's number one uh, favorite fruit uh, jam is blueberry jam. Other products include tea, uh, juices, uh, wines made in Maine, Bartlett's Wineries, uh, one of the first blueberry wines uh, made, uh, made in Maine. There was also a blueberry tea uh, in uh, Highland Blueberry Farm. They've since uh, retired so this is no longer available, but uh, the idea is there, and I'm sure somebody will pick it up again, but they're finding their organic uh, tea with the leaves in it actually at a higher uh, antioxidant content than even the fruit themselves. So drinking that tea was actually a very healthy thing to do. Products have changed, and, and this, this graph shows a number, a number of different products and a number of varieties of new products that have been produced over time. I just want to point out the bakery is really kind of decreased over time. And this little category here, pet food, is actually shown a big reinsurgence. So blueberries are finding their way into lots of different products, uh, generating new consumption and demand. And blueberries, uh, from a recent survey or study, showed that they're now North America's favorite berry as well. We've seen increases over the years of, of both uh, the wild uh, the wild blueberry increasing and the processed blueberry uh, cultivated increasing over time uh, to meet that de demand. Also seen a lot of noise in the production. Weather still is a major factor and uh, we still are not guaranteed a good crop uh, with bad weather. Uh, we've been increasing over time to meet that demand, but it uh, year to year variation uh, still makes it difficult to to, con to uh, produce a consistent uh, crop uh, every year. With the uh, with that increase in, in blueberries, you know, there's a question: Is there are there too many blueberries out there? Uh, you know, are the world's awash with blueberries, and uh, we can't handle them all, or maybe it's just too little too little demand. I mean, there are uh, instances there where we, we can uh, get new products out there and get the word out uh, how good wild blueberries are for you. And I know a lot of people uh, I've been talking, uh, people on Zoom are eating their blueberries and, and doing their, their, uh, their, their, their part in it. And we have seen, uh, and this is for cultivated blueberries, but this is actually happens for a while too, as the uh, per capita consumption has increased uh, significantly and the, the production has increased uh, to, meet that, uh, to meet that demand. So how much does it take uh, to get your wild blueberries? Up here, it says uh, one half cup. So one half cup isn't very much. It, it, it's very doable. And you get all these uh, healthy properties from this. Uh, you can uh, you have it in a smoothie. Uh, it makes it get on really, uh, really well. And as I said, there are lots and lots of different recipes out there. So if you really want more information on, on, the, uh, on wild blueberry recipes or the health product health effects, if you put wildblueberries.com in your uh, browser, or if you wanna know about growing wild blueberries uh, and some of the information I talked about, wildblueberries.main 
Tech.edu is a University of Maine website, uh, which gives all of this uh, kind of cultural uh, man management information. Lily Calderwood is currently the, the new Blueberry Specialist, and she's there to help answer your questions. And we have uh, sections on it for the public on how to grow wild blueberry in your own home garden. Uh, I was asked about this earlier to, to describe this. this is really kind of a whole talk in itself, but this particular, uh, there are uh, ways to, to grow it from seed uh, and there are particular uh, things that you, you can find for growing uh, sod, uh, sod or, uh, or, or seedling plants uh, that you can obtain from nurseries. And the real problem with, with the wild blueberry isn't that they're, it, is that they really are slow to establish and uh, they're not very competitive. So it, it's difficult to do it for your garden, but if you're persistent and you have 50 years, uh, you, you can get there, I think. Uh, there's also a ham, home garden uh, blueberry planting guide that gives the characteristics. <clears throat> Essentially, if you have a well-drained acidic soil, uh, full sunlight, uh, then you probably can go grow blueberry plants. If you have a shady spot with clay, you might as well forget it. Uh, but that's a short story, uh, but you can get the details uh, again on that wildblueberries.main.edu website. So just remember, blueberries have twice the, the amount of oxidants, antioxidants as cultivated blueberries, and they're always going to be wild and never tame. With that, I guess I can open it up uh, to questions. Well, we do have several questions, David. Can you hear me? Super, I can hear you. Let me, uh, let me All right. go. Let me see if I can get myself back. <laughs> let me know when. Uh, there we go. Yeah, I'm up there. Okay. Uh, All right. The first question is from, from Scott and Sherry, and they'd like to know if Maine wild blueberries are the same as the blueberries that are very prevalent in Minnesota. Well, um, uh, you know, when I talked about that, that sour top blueberry, uh, they are mostly the blueberries in Minnesota are the sour top type. So they have some of the same type of blueberries, but our blueberries are, are, are mostly the low sweet. So they'll kind of look the same and taste the same. Uh, and we do have some of the ones I have in Minnesota, but um, mostly the ones in Minnesota are those sour top or velvet leaves. Okay. Uh, another question, Frederick said, uh, we were told that the bright red fall foliage of the blueberry fields is more pronounced if pesticides have been used as opposed to organically farmed. Is that true? Well, uh, no, uh, and yes. <laughs> no, in that it really doesn't bring it. it um, there's a fungicide that causes the blueberries to retain their leaves longer. And this particular fungicide doesn't really create more red, but what it does is it allows the leaves to stay on. And when the, those leaves are staying on, basically what they're doing is they're taking the nutrients out of the leaves and putting it back into the plants. But you use broadly using the word pesticides, I would say no, the, the ant prior, but uh, some of the fields that maybe aren't organic, uh, maybe are cleaner and clearer uh, so that you might be able to see them more. So it's more of an indirect effect uh, than any kind of direct effect of pesticides on, on the plant. I hope that explains it. If, if not, they can ask, I can try to define it better. Okay, Barbara's wondering what month should pruning take place? Pruning can, can take place anytime when the plants are dormant and the plants go dormant, uh, it's been getting later and later. It used to be, you know, you could get a killing frost on the end of September, and now it's almost the end of uh, November before you get that. So <clears throat> what you want to do is, is make sure the plants are, are frosted, the leaves are frosted, so that abscission layer forms on the leaves and none, no more nutrients are being translocated. So, so late fall to early spring, and, and what you want to do is in the spring, you don't want to wait till the plants start growing again. The buds, the buds start swelling or the leaves start coming out or the flowers come out and then it's way too late to prune. So dormant meaning uh, that uh, no leaves and, or leaves are, are red and have been frosted and going to fall off. So in that period of time, generally from October through April is, is general, but certainly you can't prune them in with there's snow on the ground. So. And here's an, an interesting comment memory from Linda. 
She said, I've worked in the factory and was responsible to get those sticks and leaves and bugs out of the blueberries. <laughs> passed along a, con a conveyor belt, 12 hour shifts. Well, I, I did take a, actually I took a slide out <laughs> of people working on the lines <clears throat> and uh, yeah, it's uh, the machines uh, that that do the, uh, the the laser sorting. I'm not sure whether she was doing a fresh pack or whether we, she was doing a freezer line. But yeah, with fresh pack lines, it definitely uh, requires a, a, a lot more labor picking uh, picking those things out, depending on on how well the they're pre cleaned uh, before they they go through that process. I I do know uh, there's a grower at Sunkay's Blueberry Farm. She's got the best blueberries in the world. And, She's so meticulous. She's picking out little very caps with cap stems on them with a tweezer. So uh, oh, she gets my she gets <laughs> she get frosted out this year. But uh, it, uh, some people do a very good job, and uh, we we have a we have a great great uh, fresh blueberry. But it, it's really difficult to, to to grow fresh blueberries versus the the cultivated since they're they're really engineered for you know the fresh market. And we're not, but. Uh, doesn't mean we can't have good fresh blueberries there. She did, uh, Linda did just add the comment that she was working with fresh pack. Fresh pack, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it, it's a, uh, it's a, uh, she's a trooper to do that. It's hard, it's hard to get labor now because it, it's a, uh, it's tough work. I, I was, you know, thinking when I was uh, younger raking blueberries, I would go home at night and close my eyes and as all I could see is blueberries, you know, <laughs> burned into my brain <laughs> from, from raking them. So it, it does, uh, it's a tough job. Well, we have a couple more questions. Um, sure. Susan is, Susan is wondering, do processed blueberries, frozen, juiced, et cetera, offer the same substantial health benefits as fresh? Well, uh, the, the, the frozen blueberries offer the same health benefits because they lock in uh, all the minerals, nutrients, uh, vitamins, uh, freezing and process. Now, if you if you have juice, if you cook it, if you use any kind of heat process, then uh, then what happens is that you break down some of these anthocyanins and you might reduce uh, the effectiveness by maybe 50 percent. But, you know, when I'm talking to audiences, I say, well, you know, if the blueberry pie has you know, half as many, just eat two slices, you know, <laughs> just make up for it. Okay. Uh, and then a question from Marjorie. She said, how, how difficult is it to have organic blueberry production? Is it expensive? Well, it, it, it is more difficult than conventional. It, it's uh, easier if you go to a field that has been managed conventionally and, and it's cl well cleaned up. Uh, it, it makes it a lot easier to transition. It's possible, but basically, what you're you're substituting, um, you know, mechanical labor for chemical labor, and so you do have to have a lot more labor inputs. Uh, so that does become more expensive, uh, but you don't have any of the pesticide inputs, uh, which makes it less expensive. And the berries uh, can be sold for uh, you know higher price. Uh, so you know they 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 do command a better price. You tend to get lower yields on a higher price, so. It can be uh, it, it can be profitable, uh, but it does take uh, a lot more physical work. Right. That that is the end of our question list. Okay. No more. So, Brenda, do you want to say any final well, words? It, it does anybody? We can ask if anybody has a question that didn't type one in. They could ask it by unmuting themselves, and we can invite them to do that now. If anybody has another okay. question. And we might get one or we might not. <laughs> Give them a couple seconds. Um, I, actually, I have a question. Um, David, okay. when you mentioned that the bees were supplemented, the honeybees, when they bring them in, they were supplemented with bees that were brought in from Michigan. Were those bees that were like, are like wild bees that are thus released or are they in hives as well? Well, uh, they're they're in uh, actually they're in a cardboard box that it has a, a wax coating on it, and there are four quads. Uh, bumblebees are different than honeybees, and honeybees have these uh, 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 combs that go into them that uh, that they put the honey in in individual capsules. 
uh, bumblebee has kind of like a, a little mound, uh, a little uh, um, wax mound that the, the, the honey just stays in the middle. Right. And uh, so the, these are, are different structurally. And usually with the honeybee quad, you might have, uh, you know, maybe a couple hundred bumblebees uh, total and a wild blueberry hive and a, and a, and a honeybee hive, you could have 40,000 individuals that uh, are in there. So you have a, a much larger workforce. Uh, so if the weather is good, that workforce gets out there and does, uh, and does a, a really good job. But if the weather is poor, then we have uh, these uh, bumblebee quads uh, that can be substituted. Generally, you actually have to, you can't put them close to each other in the field because the honeybees will try to steal, steal uh, the, the honey from the bees. And, you know, so they, they, they don't get along, but they do complement each other uh, mm -hmm. because they work uh, under different conditions. So uh, some growers will put uh, both in the field. Some growers will just use honeybees or bumblebees, but they, they are a supplemental pollination force and, and they're, they're tamed, I guess, kind of in the same way as honeybees are tamed. Uh, they can, actually the, the overwintering queens can go out into main fields and they can find a spot in the ground or an old mattress and they can overwinter and they can come back out next spring. But uh, the, the issue is that there just aren't enough queens overwintering to you know to to really make a big difference so that's why they have to bring them in each year oh, we do so, have several more questions now david um Lynn. so here's another question mm -hmm. uh, yeah so one, one of the things i'm wondering about so we have these great uh wild blueberries in maine in the southern hemisphere of latin america you know when i look at the blueberry culture which has exploded in the u.s where we have yeah. blueberries from around the world do we have a similar variety of, of uh, wild blueberries in the southern hemisphere? Um, no, not not at all. There there are some in China. Uh, it's about forty hectares of uh, of wild blueberries in northern China, but they're not wild blueberries anymore. They're they're cultivated lowbush blueberries, and they're planted in rows and productivity. But you know, again, uh, the soil types and conditions are really not conducive to growing and they take uh, such a high number of plants and take so long to establish. I don't think that you will find anybody duplicating anything like what we have with our wild blueberries. There's a, a few places in, in Canada up in Ontario that have some uh, wild blueberry or, or cultivated uh, low bush blueberry fields. But uh, you know, the reason our blueberries are, aren't found around the world is that they don't propagate easily and they don't spread very fast. And so uh, we, we have a fortunate situation of, of having them here and being able to manage these wild stands. So uh, that's something that nobody can take away from us. Uh, so so uh, just a, re yep. a, re a related question, um, okay. as a, a sort of a, a newbie to uh, Maine um, and have, ha having lived in the mid Atlantic for a long time, we had blueberries in Pennsylvania that that the wild ones were all always and they were small like this always called huckleberries would they have been a similar variety or, or the same variety nope they would just be uh, blueberries by another name uh, well actually <laughs> there are the blueberries in Pennsylvania are called huckleberries okay and, and the blueberries out west are called huckleberries but they're actually true blueberries but to confuse things there is a, a native huckleberry and more related to an apple, it's a, it's a black huckleberry. So you could actually have some huckleberries, but I think, you know, even like with huckleberry, uh, 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 huckleberry fin, it probably was blueberry fin. It wasn't, you know, they call them huckleberries, but the genus vaccinium is, is huckleberries and cranberries and lingonberries. So it's a big ah, group. Yeah. It's a very big group and there are lots of different types of Blueberries, but the ones in Pennsylvania would be the exact same ones we have in Maine. They they run all the way down uh, the Appalachians to Georgia, uh, in the in the mountains. Oh, very cool. Yep. Okay, I have several more questions from the chat, David. Um, sure. The, Linda, the person who worked in the factory sorting blueberries. Uh huh. So what was the price for blueberries for the pickers? You showed the boxes that the blueberries <clears throat> put into on the field. 
Well, you know, it's funny because, uh, you know, the price uh, for the pickers getting the boxes haven't gone up in 20 or 30 years, but the productivity of the fields has gone up five times. So essentially, you know, if you're going into the field that gets, uh, you know, 2,000 pounds an acre, or if you're going into a field that gets 10,000 pounds an acre, you, it takes you a lot less time to rake, uh, rake those boxes up. So comparing year to year, uh, you know, and, and it really depends on uh, the fields. If the fields don't have very many berries in it, uh, then that person might give them four or $5 a box. Or if they're loaded with berries, they might say, well, I'm gonna give you 250 because you can fill up a box in 30 minutes or 30 seconds, you know? Mm -hmm. So, you know, and, and if you look at the, the blueberry rakers, the records, uh, the number of boxes they rake, now uh, the record's somewhere around 500 boxes and before it used to be 100 boxes. So although, although the box price hasn't gone up, the productivity's gone up. Uh, so they're, they have to work harder to make, uh, make the money, but they can make it in less time. So it all factors out. Well, here's another economic question. Barbara mm -hmm. says, I have heard about the recent price drops. What is the <clears throat> production in Maine and is it in danger of being lost? Well, uh, you know, if we look at the, the past few years, we had a huge crop three years in a row, 100 million pounds. And then we had a, a little bit of a drop to 87 million pounds. Then we had, we've had two disasters over the past four years. We've gone down to 54 million. And last year was 46 million. And we're saying, well, can we survive? And the reason we've had those small crops has been both freezes and droughts. And, and this is really uh, kind of an artifact of global warming. So the question is, you know, the production in Maine uh, is looking like what the production in Quebec used to look like. Huge fluctuations in productivity from year to year. And so the question is, is this here to stay? Or is this just something that's, uh, you know, a small blip? And I might say that this isn't the first time this has happened. This has happened a number of times uh, since I, uh, I was been blueberry specialist, we have good years and we have bad years. And right now, we're in an unprecedented, unprecedented uh, string of bad years. Um, the other, the other issue is, you know, the cultivated blueberry uh, in the freezers have have gone up uh, the number of pounds, like eightfold, over time. So you know, we're competing against those berries as well. So there are a lot more blueberries on the market. Uh, our blueberries are better. We're doing our best to distinguish wild blueberries and convince people to, to buy our wild blueberries, but we can't grow them because of the weather conditions are, are uh, taking the blueberries out. Uh, then, then that's going to be an issue. We, we also have seen a migration of blueberries uh, really away from the coast. All those coastal fields that, that have these nice ocean views uh, get bought up and they put a five million dollar house on it and you know then it becomes uh, no longer a blueberry seal so we've seen those disappear and that production has moved north uh, getting closer and closer to route nine and further from route one and so going further inland means uh, we have more weather variability we're not protected as much by the Atlantic Ocean moderating the temperature so there have been several factors and uh, certainly low prices and uh, low productivity has been extremely hard on growers and uh, very difficult for them to, to stay in business. But um, uh, we'll see whether this is, a, is this a trend or is it just, uh, just a down cycle? Uh, if you can tell the future, that, I'd, be, I'd be happy to listen. Okay, so Charles is asking, do commercial growers apply some fertilizers or do the berries get all the nutrients they need through the mineralization of the soil through the mycorrhizal activity that you mentioned? Well again like, like the supplemental bees uh, they do use supplemental uh, uh, fertilizer and we use a form of fertilizer called diammonium phosphate which is uh, basically nitrogen and phosphorus to supplement and we also have a procedure where we uh, take leaf samples from plants and we can tell whether these plants need nutrients or if they're deficient. So we have a, a process where we sample the leaves and if it requires, then they, then they add fertilizer. So uh, yes, <clears throat> most commercial operations in order to boost, uh, boost their productivity 
do use fertilizer, but you really have to be careful because fertilizer also increases the weed. So uh, don't want to do that, especially in organic. Interesting question from Roberta. Are there towns who monitor blueberry fields for residents to pick from? Uh, yeah, there's one in, um, I know one in um, oh, Winter Harbor uh, has, not Winter Harbor, but um, uh, Winterport, excuse me. Winterport has a field up uh, uh, that they monitor and they have rented out uh, for people to, or, or let people do. And there's one in Eaton, New Hampshire. Uh, that's the only <laughs> that's the only two I know about. Uh, there may be more, but uh, I'm not aware of any other towns. But you know, uh, certainly uh, they could do that. Uh, you know, there's a lot of a lot of uh, blueberry lands have really been bought up by nature conservancies and a lot of these land trusts. So there's quite a few uh, blueberry fields uh, being managed organically uh, through these trusts now, and uh, I think we'll probably even see more of that because their their habitats certainly worthwhile to be uh, protected. Uh, so uh, Susan was listening to you carefully. She says, were you serious about the loose field stones? If so, I would be interested. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm sure. Uh, yeah, just uh, uh, David Y at main.edu. Let me know. Uh, you know, I know a place in Alexandria. There's a lot of places, uh, I'm, I'm sure. You, you do know they're quite heavy. Uh, <laughs> you want to repeat that email address? <laughs> uh, oh, David, D -A -D David Y, D-A-V-I-D-Y, at M-A-I-N-E dot E-D-U. Okay. You know, so, right. you know, there's uh, uh, certainly uh, lots of people out there that have, uh, they just toss them off the side of the field. But the issue is, uh, the issue is uh, getting a heavy piece of equipment uh, for the cherry picker or something that you can actually pick them up with. Um, okay, well, the only other comment is, is from Linda again. I'm very impressed with David's knowledge about all things blueberry. Oh, thank you. So, very good. Yeah, thank you, Corliss, for reading the questions. And thank you, David, for that very interesting, informative program. Thank you. Thank you. Thank I always enjoy the, doing it. Yeah, great, great. Um, and thank you to the Garden Club for co sponsoring. I think with that, um, we can close the program now. Thank you. Thank you, Corliss. Good night. Thanks, David. Bye.